So I had to pay some special attention to tuberculosis because it's a, a unique entity in that it's one of the uh, only pulmonary diseases, pulmonary infections that can actually disseminate to other organs and actually quite frequently does disseminate when not treated. So tuberculosis at one time was the leading cause of death in the United States. That's dramatically changed. Now it's very rarely seen in the United States, and when it is, it's seen primarily in immigrants and in newcomers to this country. Primarily, tuberculosis is a third world problem, and it is still a problem in a lot of places. The risk groups that tuberculosis uh, tends to linger around are alcoholics, immigrants from said third world countries, healthcare workers simply because they're around those uh, individuals, nursing home patients because of their weakened immune system, patients with HIV and AIDS are at risk for tuberculosis because of their uh, weakened immune system and their low T cell count, and patients using anti-TNF drugs uh, or who are considering anti-TNF drugs uh, such as infliximab uh, and adalimumab. And since those drugs are so frequently prescribed for Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculosis is still a very relevant illness that we need to discuss. Routine screening, as far as the Manto test, PPD, is not recommended for people that aren't at an, uh, at a, in an at-risk group. So People who are not alcoholics, immigrants, healthcare workers, etc., do not need routine screening. It's not recommended. However, screening is recommended for people who are healthcare workers and for patients that are about to start an anti TNF drug. So, if you've looked at my slides on gastroenterology, on, uh, on inflammatory bowel disease, you would see that before you start a, uh, a biologic such as adalimumab or infliximab, you need to get a PPD to check for latent TB because starting an anti-TNF drug can reactivate latent TB and some people have latent TB and they don't even know it. So the offending agent here is Mycobacterium tuberculosis and this is related to the uh, bacterium that causes leprosy as well. And these are just uh, bacteria that are known for forming granulomas. And generally, the body can wall off the uh, abscess, but uh, that can be problematic when, uh, when, when the body no longer has that ability and, and the uh, tuberculum, uh, they, when they start to disseminate. So here we see uh, what the bacteria actually look like. I just thought it was a cool picture. And this is a, an x-ray of somebody with uh, cavitary lesions on, on both sides. So tuberculosis, these patients on the USMLE, uh, they'll give you a history of an at-risk group, so a healthcare worker, an immigrant, a patient with HIV. And the symptoms of tuberculosis are generally pretty standard for all of the pulmonary infections. So most prominently, it's going to be fever and productive cough, like any pulmonary infection. A lot of times, however, because this is a chronic disease, it's accompanied by the signs of chronic disease, which are fatigue, malaise, particularly weight loss. Sometimes bone pain can be present, and that would be a uh, sign of disseminated TB. The diagnosis for anybody suspected of having TB would be a chest x-ray, and we would be getting a chest x-ray anyway in a patient that's presenting to us with a fever and a cough. And on chest x-ray, the uh, sign of tuberculosis would be an apical cavitation or, uh, and or infiltrates. So going back here, we see cavitation towards the upper part of the lung as opposed to the lower part of the lung, and that's simply because Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an aerobic bacteria, so it prefers to be where there's higher oxygen levels, and those oxygen levels are higher at the top of the lung. At the same time, so chest x-ray is the f best first step in any patient where you're suspecting tuberculosis, but at the same time, you should also be getting a sputum acid fast bacilli uh, and a culture. So you're getting a smear and a culture. 
And the reason we want to get those is because th those are actually definitive. So if those come back def uh, positive, then we definitively know that the patient has tuberculosis. But it, can t it does take time. So the chest x-ray is the best first test because it will give us immediate results. Um, but it's not the most accurate test. The most accurate test would be the culture. So any patient who has a positive chest x-ray and symptoms of tuberculosis will be treated for active tuberculosis, and that's done with a four-drug therapy. So they're put on four drugs. A patient who has a negative chest x-ray and a negative sputum culture will be excluded from having TB, even if they have the, uh, even if they have the symptoms. Uh, the treatment is going to vary if the TB is not limited to lungs, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. So here are some other positive chest x-rays for TB. You can see here, uh, well, you can't really see the cavitation here. The entire right upper lung is, uh, is infiltrated. Here is a great example of a, of a TB cavity. It looks just like a, a, a lung abscess. So... Um, but the, the fact of the matter is uh, the symptoms will be different in a patient with, uh, with a uh, lung abscess. Okay, so we have four drugs that we primarily use to treat TB, and those drugs uh, came out in the early 1950s. Isoniazid and pyrazinamide were the first two, and then ifambutol and rifampin came out in the 1960s. Before then, we had no therapy for TB, and so TB was a uh, much more severe and deadly disease than it is now. So the standard treatment of active TB, so this is any patient who comes in with symptoms of TB and they have a positive chest x-ray, uh, then we're gonna go ahead and treat them for TB. And the mnemonic for remembering the medications is RIPE. And you should know that all TB drugs are somewhat hepatotoxic. So R stands for rifampin, and R also stands for red secretions. Rifampin is known to cause red secretions, namely red urine and red tears and red saliva. This is absolutely harmless. So you may have a patient who's on rifampin who comes in and says, I'm urinating blood. If they're on rifampin, you should, uh, you should get a urinalysis, but at the same time, uh, you can reassure them that it's likely the rifampin. Isoniazid uh, is a chemotherapeutic agent, and it has a tendency to reduce B6 levels uh, because of enzymatic inhibition. And so anytime we give isoniazid, which is all the time when we're treating active TB, we supplement the patient with B6. If we don't supplement the patient with enough B6, they can have neurological symptoms. And those neurologic symptoms will be peripheral neuropathy, which would be numbness and tingling. Pyrazinamide can cause hyperuricemia. Rega regardless of the hyperuricemia, you're not going to discontinue the use of pyrazinamide because it's so effective against TB. However, we're not going to give pyrazinamide, P, P for pregnant, to pregnant women. We're not going to give pyrazinamide to pregnant women. It is fetotoxic. Ethambutol is uh, another drug that's given, and that's uh, its major adverse effect is optic neuritis. E, ethambutol, E, I. So optic neuritis. However, that adverse effect is rare. So rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. For the first two months that the patient is diagnosed with active TB, the patient's going to get all four of these drugs. The last four months, they're going to get just isoniazid and rifampin. So first two months, four drugs, last four months, two drugs. But those two drugs will be isoniazid and rifampin. After the six months are up, we'll repeat the chest x-ray and the sputum acid fast bacilli stain to ensure that the uh, bacteria has been eradicated. Okay, so what's extra pulmonary TB? TB doesn't necessarily stay remain to the lungs. Most cases it is, but it doesn't have to. So there is TB osteomyelitis, in which case the tuberculi bacteria have disseminated through the blood into a bone. And generally this will happen in a, uh, in a, uh, a spinal bone. So this is also known as POTS syndrome, and it's just a tuberculous uh, infection of the bone. 
It will present with bone pain, and in any patient who's been diagnosed with TB who has bone pain, you should get an x-ray, but it's more than likely that it's the TB that's causing the osteomyelitis. So we don't need to do anything special for this. Surgical therapy is not directly indicated. Generally, the TB drugs will eradicate the, uh, the osteomyelitis. However, if it doesn't, then consult with a surgeon uh, could be in line. Uh, extended therapy could be in line um, or, or, and, and surgical treatment. TB meningitis will present with the typical meningeal symptoms. A lot of times patients uh, will present with their TB with just simply the meningitis rather than the cough and sputum and fever. So this will just present as typical meningeal symptoms. TB pericarditis will present with the typical pericarditis symptoms. So chest pain that's changed with movement, it's pleuritic, it's positional. Miliary TB is just the widespread dissemination of TB to extrapulmonary tissue. So it can spread to the bone, it can spread to the meninges causing meningitis, spread to the pericardium causing pericarditis, it can spread to the liver, to the spleen, and so forth. And this usually carries with it a worse prognosis. Either way, any kind of extrapulmonary TB is an indication for prolonged therapy. So rather than treating them for six months, we're going to treat them for 12 months or more. The specifics of prolonged therapy are outside the realm of the USMLE, but what you should know is that patients with extrapulmonary TB are going to need to be treated for a longer period of time. What you also should know is that patients with TB meningitis and TB pericarditis should also get steroids, and this is generally done with oral prednisone. And the reason is because the meninges, as in, when they're inflamed, causes meningitis, which can uh, cause neurologic symptoms. And the pericardium, when it's inflamed, can cause pericarditis, does cause pericarditis, which can cause uh, cardiac symptoms. And so we would prefer to reduce this inflammation as quickly as possible. And so we give patients with TB meningitis and TB pericarditis steroids in addition to their uh, anti-tuberculosis regimen. So now what is the PPD test or MANTO? You should be familiar with this if you uh, are watching this from the United States because all healthcare workers or individuals who are working in hospitals are required to get PPD tests. So a PPD test is used for screening asymptomatic individuals who are or will be in an at-risk condition. So what that means is that this is not used for patients who are coming in with symptoms of tuberculosis. If a patient comes in with cough and fever and they have sputum, uh, then you should be getting a chest x-ray on them. If they have sputum and cough and fever and they've got uh, night sweats and weight loss, chest x-ray. You're not getting a PPD on them. This is for asymptomatic people for a screening test uh, because their employment requires it or because they're going to be in an at-risk condition. So what the PPD test is, is it's, uh, it's a subdermal injection of tuberculin proteins which are used to gather an immune response. And the more vigorous that immune response is, the greater the induration will be. So we're recruiting T cells, we're recruiting an inflammatory response to those tuberculin proteins that have been injected subdermally. And the more induration that exists, it means that there's a greater immune response. And if there's a greater immune response, it means there's more TB antibodies, and that raises the suspicion of a possible infection. So for anybody, a greater than 10 millimeter induration is a positive reading. So we read it two days later. And greater than 10 millimeters of induration is a positive reading for everybody. Now patients with weakened immune system or patients who are on steroids, we have to handicap them a little bit because we know that their immune system is not going to be as, uh, as vigorous. And so for them, greater than five millimeters of induration is considered a positive reading. So uh, patients with HIV, patients with a history of abnormal x-rays, patients on steroids, and patients who have had personal close contact to TB. And by close contact, I mean directly having a patient, having a family member, uh, a primary family member, uh, a primary household contact, and so forth. If the patient has a negative PPD, meaning that the induration 
indicated that uh, they do not have TB, then you should repeat the test in one to two weeks uh, just to ensure accuracy because there can be false negatives. Now what happens if the PPD is positive? All patients with a positive PPD will directly get a chest x-ray. So as soon as a positive PPD is detected, they go right on to chest x-ray. You do not have to repeat the PPD in one to two weeks. So they'll get a chest x-ray and they'll also get a sputum stain. So at that point, we're just treating them as if they're a symptomatic patient. So a positive PPD, you could consider a, a variable symptom of TB. Patients who have a positive chest x-ray will be treated for active TB, as we mentioned before. So positive chest x-ray here would be just treated the same as a symptomatic patient with uh, a positive chest x-ray. So we'll give them the, the four drug therapy for two months and then the two drug therapy for four months. Patients with a negative chest x-ray will be treated for latent TB. So the reason that we are gonna treat these patients is because they did have an immune response to TB. And while the TB might not be in their lungs, it might, not be enough detectable to see it on chest x-ray. So it might be there, but it's not enough to see it on chest x-ray. So we want to treat them kind of prophylactically, but really we don't use the word prophylactically anymore. We use the term latent TB because these patients are at risk for developing TB down the road. So we want to eradicate the TB. So if they have uh, a positive PPD and a neg they get a chest x-ray and a sputum stain, and if they have a negative chest x-ray, then we treat them for latent TB, and that's just nine months of isoniazid, just the one drug. We also, of course, give them vitamin B6 because uh, to, we want to prevent the neurological side effects. As mentioned, patients with a positive chest x-ray or sputum stain, we're gonna treat them as if they've got active TB, and, uh, and that we've already mentioned. And then finally, there is a vaccine that's given in Europe and in some other countries. Uh, called the Bacille Calmet Garan vaccine. We do not recognize this vaccination in the United States, and so regardless of whether the patient has had a BCG vaccine, it doesn't matter for the workup or management of the patient. So anytime you see BCG on the USMLE, just ignore it. And that is the end of tuberculosis.